and it's a joy to welcome you uh, to worship in the sanctuary of the First Baptist Church of Charleston. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Some folks are here in the city, uh, some around the country, even around the world. It's a joy to welcome you this day. Right now, honestly, I'm here by myself, and, but it's, it's a great feeling to know that, that we're worshiping together even though we're in different places. My goal today is that you'll see the joy and the depth and the glory of God's compassion for us. Our text today is in Psalm 86, verse 15, and it reminds us of God's com- gloriously good compassion and how that compassion speaks to us, but also transforms us. So today I'm excited for you as we worship together. In a moment we're going to be singing this great hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. The expression of God's compassion is most seen in the cross of Jesus. And so it's appropriate that we begin this service offering God praise by singing this great hymn. Our choir ensemble is going to be singing it for you. Uh, but I encourage you, if you're by yourself especially, sing as loud as you want. Uh, but if you're, if you're home with your family, it may feel a little awkward to do so, but I encourage you to actually sing to offer God praise. I want to begin by leading us in prayer and then inviting you to worship. May we bow together. Father, we are thankful that you're present here today. And while I'm here by myself, I know that you are present with each person as we gather around screens to share worship together. So may your spirit touch every heart and life. May you motivate us all to trust Christ as our Savior and to walk in his ways. May we be inspired by your compassion. May our lives be transformed by that grace to be compassionate ourselves. So we thank you for the opportunity to worship together and pray your blessing in every life. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our unison reading today is from Psalm 145, verses 1 through 13. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I'll meditate on your wonderful works. They tell the power of your awesome works. I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All of your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in his promises and faithful in all that he does. Let us pray together. So Heavenly Father, as we contemplate your goodness, your greatness, and your compassion, Father, help us to understand it fully, how that compassion um, reaches down to every part of our lives and how it should flow through us so that we too show compassion to those around us in our families, in our communities. Father, through the nations, uh, that compassion, your love for all peoples is, is at the heart of the gospel. And we need to understand that. We need to understand how uh, you are uh, slow to anger when it comes to us and our transgressions. And Father, how we need to be forgiving and understanding but Father, at the same time that we need to understand one another uh, to the level uh, that we can uh, come alongside, uh, no matter what uh, area of life that uh, we struggle in or, or walk in, that we come alongside one another uh, to live out the gospel, to be your hands and feet, um, to, to show uh, the people uh, of, of all races, of, of all um, places in our nation, uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, as we focus on this, as, as we um, just come alongside um, our community, help us to be the church you've called us to be. Help us to be the ambassadors that you want us to be, uh, to live out the rich life, the abundant life you've called us to. Help us to be people of your word. Help us to be servants, uh, willing to, to, to do the things and, and go behind the scenes and to, to work uh, diligently, uh, to make sure that, that all people's voices are heard, um, to make sure that, um, that, that all people understand your love for them. And so as we transition uh, in our church life, as we look to, um, to once again embrace live uh, meetings and, and, and services, uh, Father, help us to step outside, help us to, to help uh, those who are, are struggling, help us to be who you've called us to be. And so we give you this time, we give you this service, and we just ask and pray this in your most precious and most holy name. Amen. Every Sunday when we have worship, one element of that worship service is, is giving. It's giving our offering to the Lord to serve His purpose in our city and around the nation, around the world. And because we're online now, we, it's hard to do something just like that. So we wanted to, to give you the opportunity as we worship together uh, to give God thanks for His blessing in your life and to offer that privately where you are. You can always give by mailing your offering in. You can give online. There are instructions for doing that. You can give by text. But today our heart is to give God thanksgiving. That's the goal as we offer Him our worship this morning.
Today we look at the glorious, life-giving compassion of God in Psalm 86, verse 15. Hear God's word. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. As you read that text, as you hear those words, uh, what strikes me and jumps off the page is, you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. In Psalm 86, we see this great passage that speaks to us in times of extremity, but today we see how in this text, God's compassion speaks to our souls in the deepest, profoundest of ways. If I were to describe this message in the simplest of terms, it would be God is compassionate, therefore God's people are compassionate. I want to do this today. I want you to, um, I've got a lot of passages of scripture uh, that are printed for you in the bulletin. Now, I realize your bulletin is online if you're in this particular service, but it'd be good to have it handy where you could see the different verses. I'd, I'd encourage you to read them personally later on because all these verses are so powerful and moving. But what you see in these texts is over and over and over again, God himself is described as compassionate. So in Psalm 51, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, the prayer to God. Psalm 103, verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Psalm 116, verse 5, the Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Psalm 119, 77, let your compassion come to me that I may live. Let your compassion come to me. Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Isaiah 54, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. If you recall the story of Jonah, he was upset because God was compassionate. He wanted, he wanted God to, to judge the people, and yet he was angry because God actually is compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. When you read the Gospels, one of the premier qualities of Jesus that's mentioned in the Gospels is his compassion. Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Matthew 20, verse 34. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. There's no doubt at all that the, the Lord himself is described as a God of compassion. And so we'd like to see today that the compassion of God is what makes this life possible. Apart from God's compassion, you and I, we're hopeless. His compassion is among the chief of his attributes. We could never know God or experience any of his goodness without his compassion. Why is that? Because human, human beings have sinned by, both by nature and by choice. Our hearts are distorted by our fallenness. And only because God is compassionate can we have the grace he offers us in the gospel the hope of heaven, the transformed life now, of his many perfections. God's per compassion is the one that makes knowing him possible. So apart from, apart from God's compassion, we would all rightly stand under God's judgment, hopeless. But today we see in this great text that we're told God is a God of compassion. And grace, 
slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. So the word compassion is a combination of words meaning with and suffering, to be with us in suffering. The biblical terms in Hebrew and Greek describe a deep and extraordinary, what, the, what uh, some writers would describe as a gut feeling. But it's more than that. It's a feeling of love and concern for another. It's often translated to show pity, to spare, to show mercy. Compassion sees needs and acts to meet them. Because compassion is not just a feeling. It's a feeling of pity and heartbreak for the needs of others that leads to action. Compassion is mercy in action. Compassion is pity that moves to help. It's not mere sentiment, but it thrives in a care that heals the wounds of the brokenhearted. That's why Psalm 147 describes the Lord and it says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That's compassion. So compassion is rooted in the heart. And it's expressed in action towards someone in need. And when it comes to, to God himself, he is the one who shows compassion to us. My favorite word to describe Jesus in the Gospels is that word that we mentioned moments ago as we read those texts, his compassion. So God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. What I want to suggest to you, that verse, I want you to, as you think about that verse, today I'm suggesting that when it says God is compassionate and gracious, the next phrase is in apposition to the first. That is, they describe what his compassion looks like. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love and he's abounding in faithfulness. Those describe his compassion. So let's look at these qualities of compassion that God has. It says he is slow to anger. Now what it does not say is he's never angry. It says he's slow to anger. Why? Because God is justly angry at sin or injustice. God's wrath, like molten lava, rightly burns against Sin of all kinds. And it's on the cross that we see that Jesus Christ himself bore that just wrath and stood, in ju that st and stood himself as the judgment of our sins. So righteous anger is godly anger. And justice without love is harsh and severe. Love without justice is nothing more than sentiment. So God would not be good without both the capacity for love and justice. And so it's critical to understand that when it says his compassion leads God to be slow to be angry, slow to anger, it reminds us that God yet is still just. And it's a good thing that he is because we wouldn't know about justice if it weren't for God's justice. We wouldn't know what's right and wrong, what's fair and not fair. So we should be grateful that God is just, but if God were only just and not loving, then that leaves us in a very dark place because we're unjust by nature because of our sin. So God on the cross, what we see on the cross is the intersection of God's love and justice. God loves us so much that he wants to bring us back to himself. That's his compassion. And his justice is calling out for wrath against sin. And in the cross, Jesus Christ himself took the just punishment for our sins upon himself because he loved us. We see the intersection of love and justice in the cross. And he volunteered to do it. Why? Because Jesus Christ had compassion for sinners like you, and me. He endured the just punishment of our sin upon himself, that all who would trust him may be justly forgiven by the blood-bought sacrifice of Jesus, that all who would receive him 
would have the life-transforming, grace-filled gospel of God renovate every corner of their lives. So it's my prayer that we would know this grace and this love afresh every day. That we may have His Spirit guide us in every step. That we may grow in His likeness. That we may join His mission to bring hope to a lost world. That we may act justly and seek to be a force for God's justice. All to God's glory and all to God's praise. But I want to stop right here just for a moment to remind you that when it says God is slow to anger, that is a powerfully important word for us as we relate to God. His compassion is for you. Isn't it good that God is slow to anger? Have you ever done anything that, that, uh, that you regretted later on? Even after becoming, becoming a Christian and, solving, and serving God's purpose, there are times when all of us have fall short of God's glory. And in those moments, aren't we glad God has compassion for us and is slow to anger with us? So this compassion of God is first slow to anger, but then abounding in love. It's hard to describe God's love in purely human terms. The term that is used here in this particular text, he abounds in love. He abounds in love. I don't know if you've been to the beach lately, but uh, whenever you go to the beach, the sand on our beaches here is extremely fine. And I don't know what it would be like to try to count the sand grains on the beach, but just to count the sand grains in one small bucket on the beach would be complicated and difficult. What you find is if you go to the beach, even when you wash off all the sand, somehow some sand still remains. And it's, it's reminiscent to me of the love of God. It's, it's, it's impossible to count it. It's so great. God's love is so full and so free that even when uh, we run from it, His love still finds us. So, abounding in love, His love for every human being, abounds so much so that Jesus Christ Himself would stand in our place on this cross to endure our sentence that we may know His abounding love in our lives personally. So there's good news for us. Extremely good news for us. God's compassion is borne out by His love for us expressed in His grace on the cross. Understand this. On your worst day, when you feel the least lovable, God's love abounds for you. I want you to hear what I'm telling you. On your worst day, when you feel the absolutely least lovable, God's love abounds for you. And the proof of it is Christ's sacrifice Himself. He nailed your worst day to the cross. And His forgiveness floods over your life because His love abounds for you. But also His faithfulness abounds to you. What you see here is the word faithfulness, it implies certainty. That there's never a moment when, when, if God is faithful, there's never a moment He is not faithful. We're told in the New Testament that even if we are faithless, God is faithful because He cannot deny Himself. So, we see this and we see that God is ever faithful. Even though we can't be described in those same terms, the amazing truth here is that because of His grace and compassion toward us, those qualities are accompanied by and expressed in His undeserved and absolute faithfulness to you. 
It's undeserved, yes. But it's always and absolutely true that God's faithfulness abounds to your life, seen through the lens of God's faithfulness. There is nothing that ever comes our way where God abandons us. There's nothing that's ever happened in your life. Again, the most devastating moment, there's never been a moment where because since we know God is faithful, he's abandoned us. Even when, as the Bible tells us in Psalm 23, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we are promised he will never, did you catch that word? Never forsake us. He's always with us. Faithful. He's more faithful than the sun that rises every morning. He's more faithful than the waves of the ocean that never seem to stop. You've never been left to yourself, even on your loneliest day. We see here in this great text in Psalm 86, the Almighty God, the God Most High, abounds in love and faithfulness to you. And this rock-solid truth enables us to persevere in any circumstance, no matter what, because God is compassionate to you. This verse should bring hope, should bring life, should bring joy to our souls. But this verse also should bring conviction to us as well. Scripture tells us elsewhere in no uncertain terms that our lives are to reflect the very likeness of Jesus. While there are some attributes of God that we can never share, like God's omniscience, we can know a lot of things, but we can't know everything. God's omnipotence, we have some power, but we don't have all power. Omnipresence, we can be somewhere, but we can't be everywhere. So those qualities of God are attributes we could never have for ourselves. But many of God's attributes are communicable attributes, things we can have in ourselves, so that we can reflect the image and likeness of God. In Psalm 86, 15, this is a prime example of a communicable attribute of God. God wants us, if, we, if he's compassionate to us, what does that mean? We're to be compassionate to others. So compassion and grace naturally flow out of every life saturated with the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Compassion naturally flows out of every life that's been saturated by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. So where do we get this? Well, again, your outline has a number of passages. I encourage you to go back and read them. But Ephesians chapter 4. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Colossians chapter 3, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. 1 John chapter 3, the Apostle John, We've come to know love by this, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Thus we also ought to lay down our lives for our fellow Christians. But whoever has the world's possessions and sees his fellow Christian in need, and shuts off his compassion against him, how can the love of God reside in such a person? What, Jesus, what John is saying there is, if you have no compassion, how can God's love actually be in your life? Good question. 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, he says. Zechariah chapter 7 in the Old Testament. This is what the Lord Almighty said, Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. We're to show compassion. 
So the compassion of God should flow naturally out of the life of one who knows God. So what we're asking you to do today is, is soak in and dwell in and richly live in the beauty and joy of God's compassion for you. He's slow to anger. He abounds in love. He abounds in faithfulness. All these are blessings to our lives. But Jesus told many parables, two of which I want to recount for you today, that are the operative ones for us to relate to this truth this morning. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells the parable of the unforgiving servant. A king settling his debts. There's a man who owes him what it says here in the, the new NIV. It says uh, he owed him 10,000 bags of gold. So man owes 10,000 bags of gold. He comes in, he says, I can't pay it. He says, he falls on his knees. Be patient with me. I'll pay back everything. And the king took pity on him. It says, took pity on him. Same word as compassion there. Canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant who was forgiven went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. Now, he owed 10,000 bags of gold versus 100 silver coins. And he called the debt in, and he, he grabbed the man and says, Pay back what you owe me. The servant fell to his knees, begged him, be patient with me, I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into the prison until he could pay the debt. So the man forgiven this enormous amount couldn't forgive this small amount in, in the life of one of his debtors. So when the king gets word about this, he calls the man back in and says, you wicked servant. I cancel all that debt because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he paid back all that he owed. What Jesus says here as he concludes this, he says, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each one of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. What Jesus is telling us here is, if you truly know, God's grace, if you truly know God's compassion, then to fail to share it is evidence that you don't know it. It's impossible for someone to have a grace-filled life and not show grace. Now, can you have moments when you are not grace-filled and not acting in the right way? Of course you can. But too many people are walking around with a scorecard looking to be offended when God's called us to be people who show grace in all that we do. We recognize our need for grace, we live in it, and when we do so, we can't help but to show that grace to others. In the parable, the servant never understood the king's mercy because had he understood it, he would have shared it. The, this parable speaks to us this morning. If we know God's compassion, if we're grateful that God is slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, then, then if we are truly grace-filled by God's grace, then we're going to show compassion and grace to others. A second parable, you already know it, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10, Verses 30 to 37. And in the, in the parable, you know the story. The man, uh, there was a man going to Jericho. He was attacked by robbers, left for dead on the side of the road. A priest goes by, sees him, crosses to the other side. A Levite goes, crosses to the other side, passes by. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him. And it says in verse 33, when he saw him, he felt compassion he came to him and bandaged up his wounds pouring oil and wine on them and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him on the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said take care of him whatever more you spend when i return i'll repay you so jesus says which of the three the priest the levite or the samaritan 
do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And the Pharisee who was having to answer the question could not say the word, the Samaritan. He said, simply the one who showed mercy. Jesus answered wisely then, go do the same. So why did Jesus use the Samaritan as his example? In the culture of that day, uh, the Jews lived in one section of that part of the world, uh, in that area that's known now as, I guess, modern Israel area. But the, uh, the Jews lived in one portion, the Samaritans lived in another portion. The Jews worshipped in Jerusalem, the Samaritans did in Samaria. And, and there was some bad blood between them. And, and an, the average Jew person would never, of that day would never have allowed a Samaritan to be part of their daily life. They lived separate lives. I suppose the Samaritans looked down on the Jews, the Jews looked down on the Samaritans, but there was, no, there was no common life there. In today's world, you could look at places all around the world and, and the same kind of thing is going on. So why did Jesus choose the Samaritan to be the one in his story who was the hero of the story, so to speak? Because Jesus wanted us to see that compassion comes from God. And that God is no respecter of persons. And that God wants us to show compassion regardless of, of the identity of the people around us. I think it's fascinating that Jesus, when he chose his disciples, he picked Matthew, who was a tax collector. The tax collectors were, were um, loyal to Rome. They were hated by the average person, but to the zealots, they were the worst. So he picked Matthew, the tax collector, and he picked Simon, the zealot. Put this in 2020 American politics, and you had one Republican and one Democrat of the most extreme variety there are as disciples of Jesus. What does that tell us? Jesus doesn't care about the boundaries that we often put up in our lives. He says, if you really know me, you're going to break down those barriers. The barriers of ethnic barriers, cultural barriers, political barriers, economic barriers, you name it. The main point of this story is compassion from the presence of God in our lives is Christ-like. He says, go, do the same. Show compassion. God has called us not to ignore needs, not to ignore people, not to ignore people in need, but to show compassion. And to have compassion, the priest and the Levite, they looked away. They saw him, but they looked away. I believe God's calling every one of us to be people who see people, and not rather than looking away, looking to. How can I be a neighbor? How can I show the compassion of God to those around me? We've got a lot of unrest in our country right now. And there's no doubt in my mind that it's the presence of sin in the world. There is structural sin in the world because human beings are sinful people. But the only way this kind of sin is dealt with is we have a compassionate God who's slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, who calls us to be on his team, to be the kind of people who are compassionate, showing grace, slow to anger. That's working toward justice, but not showing anger all the time. And abounding in love, abounding in faithfulness. God has called us to be people who see people, and rather than ignore them, move toward them. Today, I believe God has called us to rejoice in and to celebrate God.
God's compassion for us, but then to be moved to tears for our lost world around us. Right now our city is seeing some things that I, I didn't think possible, honestly. I could look at it and say this is terrible and, and be judgmental, or I could have compassion. Today, that's my call to you. Let's walk in the compassion of God himself. How's that happen? It only happens when we come to the place where we understand that apart from his grace, we're hopeless. That cross, the intersection of God's love and justice, is where your life needs to go. It all starts there. So you begin by trusting Christ to be your Savior, to have his life transform our lives so that now we can become like him in all respects. Let's bow together. Father, may we today come to your presence, rejoicing in your compassion, your grace, rejoicing that you're slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. And I pray we may live there, but also live in that compassion, that the world may see, that our society may see, that those who may not look like us, those who may not be in the same in same social club as us, those who may not be in the same school as we are, those who may not walk in the same circles that we walk, I pray that we would see people as you see them and have hearts of compassion. Committed to your justice. Committed to the good news of the gospel. Because you are the only hope. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we close, I want to invite you to sing God's goodness, His steadfast love, as we worship together in response to His compassion and love and grace.
Thanks for joining us in worship on this Lord's Day. It's my prayer that you will grow in His likeness as you walk in His ways. I want to pray now to ask God's blessing for you in this week and each day that passes. Let's bow together. Father, we come before you now. And thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for your compassion toward us. May each one of us grow in your likeness. And now may we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory now and evermore. Amen. Amen.